horses. They do it because they couldn't find uh, either the quality or the reliability in, in those that were doing it. So I uh, started shoeing my horse and shoeing my buddy. I was on a rodeo team in college and uh, shooting my buddy's horses and it just it just led to this career I didn't really intend. Um, the farriers I well, horseshoers I knew growing up wouldn't have inspired you to become a horseshoer. And especially not my family. My, my dad was like, son, you're, why would you want to just drink till you run out of money and then shoe horses till you have enough money to get drunk? That's kind of what we'd seen a lot of horseshoers do. And um, I fell in love with it. So once you start shooting a horse, if you were meant to shoe horses, there's nothing like it. If you were not meant to shoe horses, don't do it because it would suck. Your whole life would be just just misery. And, and that's, I think, what happens. Some guys learn the skill, they learn it well enough to make money, and they realize what an incredible living it can be. And they get stuck in a rut because they don't enjoy it. But if it's your passion, man, it is incredible. So you'll never do it perfect. And it doesn't matter. Man, I've seen, I've seen some of the best in the world. I've worked with some of the best in the world. I've been all over. And it doesn't matter how good you are, and how much you practice, and how much you study, you don't know it all. You will never make the perfect shoe. You will never shoe the perfect foot. You'll get some that are close. And you'll have some in your memory that are better than they were. But the reality is, uh, there's always a there's always a, something to grab. But if you worked on a factory line, you put bolts on a, on a, you put nuts on a bolt. You know, at a certain point, you would be as good as you're going to get, and, and and you would reach the top of that. I would think pretty soon. But if you're shooting horses, you'll never reach the top. And and it, your, your knowledge will keep going, and your body's going, and everything's great, you're wonderful, and then all of a sudden your body starts doing this, and even though your knowledge continues to increase, now I'm at this point in my career. So somewhere between probably 35 to 47, I felt like everything was going up, and I was getting stronger and better, and everything was great. And then at 47, my eyes, my knees, everything, so now my knowledge continues to improve, but my, my body will not let me do what I want to do. So I think that happens in, in a lot of trades. College, I went to college, so I, I got into military school in high school, and it was so freaking hard that college was easy. So I was breezing through college. I was just there to rodeo, really. Uh, met Kelly, we got married, and so she wanted to finish college, so we just kept going to college. And I, I used an Army scholarship to finish up, so I didn't pay for college, which was kind of a, I, I suggest that if you go to college, uh, get scholarships. I, I had uh, uh, started out thinking I might be a lawyer. Uh, why not? You know, it looked uh, that's what my dad did, and it, it looked like it would be okay. Um, and then as I went through college, I just kept shooting horses, and my, my my academic side was so secondary. I did okay. I mean, I, I got good grades, but I didn't care about any of it. And and so I wanted to stay in this industry for as long as I could. I mistakenly thought that being an educator would be easier than being a shooter. Um, and it is in some ways. So I, I can make uh, money on tuition that I'm not making for shooting horses. So on, on that side, you can say, oh, well, that's great. But the opposite side of that coin is I have to shoot a lot of rank horses. So you are like the beginning horseshoer. Your, your business, your clientele is like the beginning horseshoer for your entire career. So even, um, what am I now? Thirty seven years into it, 30 something years into it. I started in 87 and I'm still having to crawl under snakes, you know? And if I was a full-time farrier, there's a lot of horses that I touch every day that I wouldn't even, wouldn't be anywhere on my radar. So um, physically it is still as demanding. And I thought by being an educator that it would be less demanding. And I was, I was wrong, but you know, God kept my body together long enough that I can still do it. And I started my first school in 92. So I was 23 years old, uh, just out of Fort Lee, Virginia, just out of, I had my journeyman, I had my master's degree. I had, I was an officer in the military. So I had some leadership training from that perspective. Um, but I, I still, I was too young really in hindsight to do it. But uh, as we spoke last night, the beauty of being young is you don't, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So you just charge ahead. And so we survived it. I ran a school in Colorado. I started a school in Colorado for another gentleman in 92. I ran it till 94. And in 94, we came to Missouri. And I mean, we were so broke. For the next five years, really, it was kind of, you know, fight over the pork and the pork and beans and lick the label kind of lifestyle. Um, so I, I wanted to have my own school. 
the school in Colorado, I was running it. It was, I put it together, it was my deal, but I was not the owner. I was not in charge of all the decisions. Students couldn't forge after hours, you know, some, some stuff that just, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. So we moved here, bought 10 acres and uh, just kept pushing. You know, they, they, nobody in town thought it would survive. Nobody that, nobody that knew my story thought there was any chance I'd still be running a school, what, 20 some years later. Um, but uh, you know, it was my destiny, I think, my calling. Our 24 week class is our, our main class. Like right now we have 23 students. And of those, we have uh, 17 that are 24 weekers. So they're with us for the six month program. Uh, next year, we're not gonna have any 12 weekers. So we have 12 and 24 now. Uh, the curriculum is really based right out of my textbook. So we start with anatomy, we go to uh, confirmation, and then gates, correcting faults gates, and then into pathology. So that, and then, and then we have business about, about the middle of that. So right after we get done with anatomy or confirmation, somewhere in there, we will do um, a, a pretty solid business block. That is the theory side of it. The number of students is based on the number of horses that we have. So the area has uh, a population of horses that supports 23 students. Also, it's my son who's AWCF and CJF. My wife's a certified farrier. My daughter and her husband are both farriers. Cody's wife's a certified farrier. So there's six of us in the family that all shoe horses. So we have a, a, a huge staff if we need it. And then um, uh, we also have a, a couple of, of graduates that have been standing around. And, and so the, uh, the amount of, of one-on-one -on -one that a student can get is pretty immense around here. Um, with, if I have less than 20 students, I have too many horses. If I have more than 24, I don't have enough horses. So that's kind of how we're basing it. If you get out there and you don't know anatomy and you're trying to work with a vet on a, on a vicular case and he says, well, the deep flexor tendon is passing over the cototrochia bursa right here, and you're like, uh, blah, 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 you know, then you're, you're, you're in trouble. So you need to understand what the deep flexor tendon is, what the cototrochia bursa is, where it's going, what it's doing, and how your shoeing is going to affect that. So if you don't have that basic understanding, you're setting yourself up to, to hurt a horse. So, so um, a student has to tick uh, four boxes to graduate. So they have to pass their theory side, which is a, uh, a series of tests. They have to have a, an average to, to pass. They have to pass an average of forge projects. And so there's a list of forge projects that's up on the, on the wall at the school you'll see. And there are certain on there that are required. Like they have to make a horseshoe sandwich. They have to make a front shoe. They have to make a bar shoe, you know, stuff like that. And if they don't get those done, they don't graduate. And they have to pass their final horse. So we do a light week is 125 horses. So we do 125 horses to 250 horses a week. So students are getting under a lot of feet, which is pretty important. But um, their final horse, all of a sudden, they'll, they'll say go, you know, it's a timed event. And they'll melt, you know, they don't, it's, uh, it's, it's, the mental game of that is so hard, but man, does it prepare them. So they want to get out and get certified or journeyman by being under the gun at the final horse, that helps a ton. And also when they got to go work with a vet or work on an expensive horse or in front of an owner, um, that prepares them for that a lot. So they got to tick that box. And the final one is attendance and participation. You know, they live in the bunkhouse. If they're not here, we find them. So it's not a problem. <laughs> So forge welding is simple. If, if, if you had to bake a cake, you could probably do that. Even without help, you probably could beat the box and do it, right? So if you have the right oven and you have the right ingredients, the right mixing uh, utensils, and you handle it correctly, you can end up with a cake. Forge welding is the same. And the people that are coming in on day one don't know that. And so they are forge welding at the end of day one without flux in the coke fire because they have the right oven, which would be the coke fire, they have the right utensils, which would be the tongs and hammer. And they have the right ingredients, which would be the, the steel. And if they handle it correctly, they can forge well. And since they don't know what they don't know, then we make them understand how easy forge welding can be. And so um, in, old, in, in, in the old days, I think before uh, gas fires, I think it was just a natural thing that everybody could forge weld in the coal, coal fire. 
gas fires came along and all of a sudden it was extremely difficult to do because it's such an oxidizing fire. And the, the uh, flux bottles, man, they didn't help. You know, get the iron hot, put flux on it, get it red and hit it. You know, and that's, that's not all you need to know. And so the, uh, uh, there was this huge, huge group of farriers when I was coming in that thought forge welding was, you know, impossible. There's some guys who went to school, I, I talked to a guy who went to school and he, he said, yeah, they told us that uh, forge welding was impossible in modern steel, so I never got to learn that. Well, okay, <laughs> let me show you how we do it with this. <laughs> We do mainly hot shooting, and then our 24-week students, their last eight weeks, have to do all handmaids. So we are we are preparing them to do all handmaids throughout the course. And then, so so remember I told you how hard military school was to make college easy. There's a saying: the more you sweat in practice, the less you bleed in battle. And I am a huge believer in that saying. And so our school is so hard. They're making handmaids when they don't have to. They're pulling clips when they could buy pre-clipped shoes. Um, they are using a rasp when they could use a grinder, you know, that side of, sort of stuff. But then when they get out in the real world, their career is now much easier because they survive going through the heartland. Uh, I've had students call me, I had a student call me, he'd been out about five years, he said, listen, he said, today was horrible, he said, the horses were bad, I got kicked, got stomped, it was, it was hot and it was muddy and it was flies and it was in the sunshine. It was, he said, it has been the worst day of my career. It has still been easier than my easiest day in the heartland. <laughs> and so, you know, that's that prepares people. It's, it's a military perspective, right? If the training is super hard, then battle's not as hard. The first two days are death by fire, so they are in the forge and in the book. So we start talking a bunch of anatomy, we start teaching the anatomy. Day three, we don't always get to do a dead foot, so they'll either trim a live horse or, or do a dead foot. Um, we just don't do a lot of dead feet. We do enough that we can do dissection. So that afternoon we do a dissection, Day four, they're under horses, and pretty much from then on. So um, the the two days of anatomy and the dissection and the and the very careful preparation for that lets them realize just what their margins are. You know, there there's not a lot of soul depth. There's not a lot of distance between a hoof wall and the and the corium whenever you drive a nail. You know, there's there's things that they need to know before they just start hacking on it. And so we spend the first three days getting them ready for that, and then the fourth day they're under horses. And, and carefully watched. I mean, it's not, uh, uh, they're not dropped off at a farm, <laughs> you know, so, so they, they are, are very carefully watched. And then as they get better, they get to do more and, and, and more and more and more. So horseshoe schools don't necessarily attract academics, right? We don't get a lot of guys here that are deciding between doing this and a degree in biochemistry. So as a result, we'll get a lot of students that are maybe dyslexic or uh, were, were termed learning disabled by schools or whatever. So one thing we did was we had the textbook uh, read by Brian uh, Mullins. So we actually have the book on audio. So some of these folks that don't like to read or, or don't get a lot out of reading are, are very auditory. And so they have the opportunity to listen to the book on tape, which I think is, I think it's been huge. I think it's really helped a lot of people. Um, we cover it in the class. They do dissections. We are always talking about it, and then we show them how to make flashcards. For, for me, when I'm learning something, flashcards have been the best way for me to do it. So I will, you know, let's say on the front of the flashcard it says suspensory ligament. On the back side it'll have a picture, and it'll say interosseous muscle, interosseous tendon. I'll have maybe a, the description of the origin insertion, and maybe a picture of whatever I need to have on it. So when you make your flashcard, you learn a lot in that process. But then, whenever you're studying, if you know that one, it's easy. It goes in the pile of stuff you know. If you don't know it, it goes in the pile of stuff you don't know. So you're constantly studying the stuff you don't know and reviewing occasionally the stuff you do know. And so I think that's, that's the pathway for, for most to, to learn a lot. Our school attracts a pretty certain individual. So we don't get somebody, the, the people we attract in the heartland are, are really, pretty dedicated people. We get a lot of people that are already farriers. We get a ton of farriers kids. I've got two students right now that are legacy students. Their dads both came here. So as a result, our horsemanship is not as big a problem as I think it is for some other schools or for some other places. Um, and also we handle a lot of rank horses. So from, from day one, they're having 
well, I guess day three, they're having to deal with horsemanship. And, um, uh, and we talk about it a lot, and especially if I see a student that's wanting. You know, we have a student that's, uh, that is obviously going to get himself in danger or, you know, something like that, then we, we talk a lot about horsemanship with those people. And I have kicked people out for uh, horsemanship infractions before. I had one student, he, uh, he was an older gentleman, he was probably in his 50s when he came to school, and he insisted on wearing a cowboy hat that didn't fit, and it would fall off all the time, and it would fall off under horses and spook them, and, and then he would go for, he'd have a horse stuck him back on a lead rope ready to lunge forward, and he'd walk in to get his cowboy hat. And I pulled him out a couple times, and finally, because when, when a horse is sucking back, it's a, a really dangerous horse, because they're gonna lunge forward next and when they do they're going to smash whatever's in front of them and uh i i barely saved his life on my third occasion and I, I just i had to send him home because he wasn't getting it right and so um, yeah we're not gonna we're, we're gonna do everything we can to keep him from getting hurt bad but we always talk about the three c's so it's clinics contests and certification and so this trade has burnout. Um, when you're first starting out, you think there's no way you'll ever get easy, right? And you do your first half a horse, it took you four hours, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'll never be able to make a living at it. Well, then you finally start figuring it out, you start making faster decisions, you start shooting horses in an hour or less, and then you're uh, four or five years into it, and you're getting burned out. You're like, man, I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering how bad it would be to be a mechanic or something, you know? But the guys that go get certified and they go chase some contests and they're always going to clinics, those guys, those or those people, I should say, because we get so many female farriers now, those farriers, they tend to have longevity and uh, they tend to build some desire, they build some, some goals. That's how, you, that's how you do it. So continuing education, it's, it's critical in this trade. Uh, you can get isolated pretty easy. You have your 300 horses, you have your 150 customers that tell you how wonderful you are and and you just see those same horses those same people the same feet year after year and you don't realize what the greater world is doing it's a little better now with uh, uh, social media because you see other work a lot easier than you used to but it used to be there was some isolation was a big problem what we find and this is very uh, broad statement, right? This is this is just a this is stereotyping. Um, the female students make horses so much more comfortable. The horses like them. It's uh, from the from the actual getting under horses and trimming perspective. The females make a way better student. But when it comes to the forge work, just the sheer hours that we demand of forging, the male students do better. So in reality. Um, both sexes have different, you know, different strengths and bring different things to the table. I'm thrilled we have some new female students because it breaks it up, you know, and it's uh, it's a little bit more uh, fun for me to uh, uh, to teach because I have more variety. Because it used to be I'd get one student, one female student a year, maybe two, and they weren't so female-like anyway, you know. It was it was very different. And I know some schools. There was a school in Canada. I think he had uh, 14 girls in one class. Um, we're about half and half now, and uh, it's it's been it's been neat to watch. It's been neat to watch. Surprising. I wouldn't have expected it. Did some clinics in Colombia. I took Kelly down there with me in the Colombia, South America, and uh, she's a she's an excellent shoer. She's she teaches and she has for for well since '95. Uh, she's been in here with me teaching, and um, uh, she got into horses there. And there's a crowd of 300 men. And that culture was so shocked to see a female shoer. They were like, oh my goodness, but what did that man do to his wife? You know, how terrible is that? So, so that culture still hasn't, hasn't uh, accepted it. But uh, here in North America and Canada and what have you, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So I had, a, I had a, a incoming student ask me, what would I do different with the Heartland if I could? Which is kind of what you're asking. I don't think I'd do anything different. So I'm, I'm in a beautiful place in my life where I can do what I want to do. And if I wanted to do something different, if I, if I felt there was something I could do to make it better, I would. And I don't know what it would be. You know, um, we have students that, uh, that come to school in, in the blacksmith course in February and they're journeymen in September. So I, I, I think our program is working extremely well. Um, the biggest 
thing that a student needs to have when they come to school is work ethic. If they allow, if they allow any laziness to seep in, our program is set up that it requires you to push the boundary the whole time. Uh, I tell people often that I've made my living setting un unrealistic expectations and fully expecting people to achieve them. And so the problem with that for some people is that they're always under pressure. I'm always pushing them and they're always, they're always behind. And for some, it brings them to the top. For some, it pushes them down further. So, so if you come to the heartland, what you really need to have is work ethic. If you have work ethic, we can do something. If you don't have work ethic, you probably are not going to be comfortable here.